Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast, the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT to discuss their lives, their journeys and their ambitions with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. And we, Steve, are now officially the greatest motorsporting podcast in the world. We are award winners. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Is that your first ever win? Unfortunately, it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not dwell on that. Uh, Steve, question for you. How does it rank amongst your TT wins? Well, in all fairness, I've got some lovely, shiny trophies from mm-hmm. winning various races, and especially the best one, the senior. So where's my trophy, fellas? Yeah, we didn't even get a trophy, did we? All three of the producers sat on their phones, texting away. In fact, you probably heard one of them vibrate then. Unbelievable. How, did, how, how on earth did we win it? Do you know why we won it? Because of people out there that voted for us. So um, on behalf of me, Steve, the producers, and Lee, I've already mentioned it, but a huge thank you to everybody that voted, because without you, we'd, we'd just, well, no one would be listening to us, would they? Yeah, thanks very much from us. Appreciate it. Right, let's get on with today's episode of the podcast. A big strapping giant of a man. If you were going to build a TT racer, you'd build him like Sean Anderson, wouldn't you? He's he's primed and prepped for a for a TT racer. He's a big unit, a busy boy. Races the TT, the Manx, and races well. Yeah, but away from motorcycling racing in general, he does a lot behind the scenes for a lot of uh, a lot of companies, doesn't he? Yeah, he's got a very interesting workload away from racing. I'm looking forward to asking a lot of questions about that, not just his racing career. What are you going to try and find out from him? Just various things, really. On, you know, then. he's he's married to a racer as well. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, I never knew this. Yep. You see, I do homework. Do what? Homework. Never heard of it. So so what does she, what does she race in? She races the Manx. Oh, I never knew that. I, I, yes. should really, I should really look into people that we have on the... It's Sean Anderson. It's not... Sean Anderson's missus's podcast. It's Sean. She'll be listening. I hope she is. Mm-mm. Right. You're anyway, in trouble. No, I'm not. Sean, can, listen. Sean can tell us all about her career when when he gets here. I'll all do. Right? I'll do. All right. Let's get on with this episode of the podcast, Stephen. Head over here. All right, sweetheart. Sean Anderson, thirty nine years old. 43 TT starts, 27 TT finishes, a hit rate of 53%-ish. Fastest lap of 130.357 miles an hour. So he's also hit the 130 club, but less of that. We'll talk about all that later on. Sean, what I want to know is, do you listen to the TT podcast? You have to understand, right, I'm a complete TT fanatic. There isn't a, <coughs> an, a YouTube clip for three seconds of somebody going flat out through the bottom of a gallery that I don't watch. <laughs> oh, there's a, a new podcast this week. Oh, there's a, a Between the Hedges, there's a such and such, there's a, document, there's a documentary in German about such, like, Trumer or somebody like that there. Right, I watch that with subtitles. There's, there isn't anything <laughs> ah! that goes on Mega. that I don't try to keep my hand in, I'm in terms of TT. I'm, like, completely obsessed and uh, history of the tt course knowledge notes this that and the other so like has that been something you've always you've always done have you always been a tt fanatic from the the word go or um actually so as a like i was brought up around bikes all my life but the tt was like something that my dad helped out um racers at the tt mm-hmm. or a racer from from um Tandergy direction and it was something that my dad went off to the TT and when I was like, I was brought once as a child when I was about 10 or 11, just before you finished primary school. And uh, in comparison t- to the excitement of group racing in Ireland, like road racing in a group, yeah. when you're 10 and you see someone go, boom, he'd be back in 15 minutes, 20 minutes, <laughs> and the next guy goes, boom. It was not exciting, yeah. but... When you, as I grew older and grew into it and understood it yeah. as, a, as a spectacle, then it only came to consume me more and more. And then, I, as I say, spectator once, and the next time I was there was to race. And how old were you then? Oh, I was an old boy. I would come to this way too late. I was 26 when I first did the Manx in 2010. Bloody hell. So, so in between going and watch it as a TT fan and then racing it as a, as a TT competitor or a Manx competitor... What's, what's happened in all that time? 
There's quite a bit, like obviously in that time frame, but uh, in general, like has it been bikes, bikes, bikes all the way it, through it, though? It was always like it was always bikes, but I never raced. I wasn't a child prodigy type mm. thing. My my father's like complete, also motorcycle enthusiast. Loves road racing, TT, and all the rest. Did he and, race? No, no. I'm a I'm a Gen One racer. Yeah. So oh. and uh, but so always had bikes around me, ride bikes. For fun, I think there was an, an importance on an uh, element of like push or not to push, like be a, a competition dad of like screaming at kids and all. So it was always like bikes were fun, go to practice days yeah. on motocross trials, rode a lot of trials, this that, and the other. But and then I was just a, a bloody idiot on on the road. And I, I like me and my wife joke. I still have no idea how I made that sort of like from sixteen till I started racing when I was twenty four. <laughs> that, that gap. I mean. I, the, the the bones the scars are all there to prove it but I, you know touch wood one way or another like I actually made it there and then because um, I had been brought up with somebody who had mechanic I was like well I'll be a mechanic mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I hope friends who started racing and maybe they won't, on a Sunday morning on a sprightly run to wherever they might not have been as quick but they started to get top tens in racing and I was like. I think I might have to give this race and really? a lark year go. <laughs> that was it. And that was at age 24. So I'd finished university and got my degree in engineering and this, that and the other, in motorcycle engineering and design. And uh, we said, I said, I'm going to take, do one year. Uh, just one year, probably be no good, but I'll have experience of saying I, I raced at some time. And then, but as soon as I raced, like I already knew because I was a road rider, I was like, Go into somewhere that's flat, especially in Ireland, like Kirkston, Bishop's Court, everything's X. Airfield is flat and mm -hmm. boring as sin. Whereas like you on a Monday morning on the way to work, you were tearing over blind crests and jumps and this, that and the other. So it was like, well, I think I'll have to just do some road racing. <laughs> and then the Everest of road racing is the TT. Yeah. Or, anyway, for for an for a real amateur, it's a Manx Grand Prix and with aspirations of the TT after that. And it was always like well, we'll go there once and try and see what it's like and whether I like it and whether I don't and all the rest. And yeah, just snowballed from yeah. there on. Were you any good, trials rider? Um, I'd like to tell you I was. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> modern or pre-65? Sorry? Modern bikes, pre-65. Modern, pre modern. So I still have a gas gas in the garage. So both me and my wife both have trials bikes. So yeah. in terms of like... Who's the best? <laughs> I, I, I won't. I, I'll, I'll keep the piece that we're we're, we're both <laughs> aspiring trials riders. <laughs> so go back to your first race. Then obviously you thought you were a bit of a doer on the road, on the commute to work. Yeah. But then you know it's a completely different kettle of fish when you get onto a start line with twenty, thirty other people. Where was your first race? How did it go? Oh, so <laughs> I mean, it's quite quite funny. So there, there used to be like a closed a club race. At the very start of the year, it was a Paddy's Day weekend, so middle of March, Ireland, obviously tropical weather. And um, it was primarily for, there was a, a specific like amateur clubman's, like rookie 600 style uh, in the ACU sort of format. And uh, instantly turned up, pish wet day, crashed in first qualifying, like <laughs> touched the white line, down I went, qualified wherever. And uh, first race was, like working my way through, finished twelfth, and the second race, finished tenth, and I come away like, oh, you know, this race in Malarkey, it's, it's not too bad. I think. I, what, I, what was this on? Like two thousand and three R six, yeah. and this was two thousand eight. Right. So she was a wee bit long in the tooth, and I thought, I'm the, I'm the man, obviously. Like top ten first first week, race weekend, brilliant and all this. The following weekend. Easter fell early, and Easter's the real start of the season in mm -hmm. Ireland. So, he, like Easter Saturday, at back to Bishop's Court, but you're with national men, and this was 2008. So, you had sort of peak Cameron Donald and Bruce Hansley <laughs> on relentless Ta Suzuki's, <laughs> and I can remember the the first chicane up the back at Bishop's Court. Anybody who knows Bishop's Court knows the sort of first flip flop chicane, and I was sort of like teetatively tipping in, and Cameron Donald just came under me and went boom, boom, from right, left, and he was exiting, and I was still entering the corner, and I came away from that, like, from going from, like, top 10, yeah, yeah. this this racing's definitely, it's just coming so easy to being, like, 
I don't know. Like, <laughs> is, is what I'm doing classified as still riding a motorcycle at that stage? So I was like, I, I really went from like two weekends before on a high of all highs to like just being like, I, these people, they don't, they're not, they're not on a, like, they don't work on the same level as Physics other people. Physics don't apply yeah. to them. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God. But you, you, you kept at it. You, you, yeah. you committed to it then. Yeah. I mean, we, we messed around that first season, 600s, and then I got a, like a fluke chance to ride a thousand, which happened to be <sighs> a, like a cousin of mine's that was, it's in the back of the lorry. If you want to pay for the extra entry, you can have a run of my thousand. And I, I like jumped up. I was a, like, I'm a big lad now, but I was a bit bigger even then. And uh, like just took to a thousand CC, like duck to water. And uh, it, it was like, okay, right, let's get rid of this R6 and get a big bike for next year. And then I did another year in short circuits and thousands, lifted the the amateur championship in Ireland, the Clubman's championship. And uh, was like, right, what do we do now? Either you can go to like national thousand CC, but you had a lot of like top guys like Michael Pearson, Kirk Jemison at that time in Ireland. The Irwin, like Glenn was coming through yeah. in 600. He obviously moved on to much bigger and better things and all the rest. And we were like, and I was like, well, I really fancy a run at the roads. And 2010, I started doing the roads and we did the Manx in 2010. And that was, the love affair was written with the Isle of Man from that point onwards. Yeah. How do you take to like a duck to water on a thousand cc bike? Because uh, I hate to bring my motorcycling uh, expertise up, but I remember the first time I jumped on a thousand, and I, I, my brain and body could not tolerate what was going on. I, and that was that was at Portimao, big wide open circuit, so it, it's pretty slow. How do you how do you get on it and go? Yeah, this is for me. This. I, I th well, I, I think you. It all it all depends when you're exposed to that sort of scenario because like I was 25 by that or 24 25 at that stage and it was a, and a complete speed addict so yeah. it was like everything had to be ridden as fast as it possibly could be ridden so it was like here's a low here's here's a turned up ta here's a bike that you've like I only ever had 600s on the road running so here's a bike but turned up to 11 and oh, it was yeah. just like wow <laughs> it's like given an addict here's a big bag of whatever you're addicted to <laughs> and uh, have a load more of it. Well, what's not to love about it, so... True, yeah, but it, there is a... It's not just turned up to 11. It's turned up to 11 and then added a bit more to it. They're, I don't think people realise how fast these bikes are and the way you guys ride them and make them look like they're so easy to ride, I think it, it doesn't really do it justice just how fast those things are, does it? You told me you was really good. I am pretty good. I'm pretty good. We'll find out at her Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only on. A, I, I, I've got a little triumph, six seven five, but I'll, I'll yeah, I'll put a few people to bed. Don't you worry about that. And what about on the track? <laughs> 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 hey, this is family friendly. This. Oh, okay. oh right. So Sean, normally we start the podcast as a, an avid fan of the podcast. You'll even know what what first question we have. But seeing as we we kind of started chatting, we we let it roll. But let me rewind it back a little bit. The tap on the shoulder. Now, not to diminish your talent, because you're way faster than I'll ever be, but by the time you get the tap on the shoulder, we've had maybe 15 to 20 riders going off. So a lot of them have had the tap on the shoulder before you've even probably put your helmet on. Yeah. So let's talk about the tap on the shoulder. But what is it like being a, a rider slightly further down the grid? And I'm not, I'm not belittling that but you get to see a lot of them go before you've even probably prepped and you're ready to go. So how does that like five or 10 minutes feel as the riders are leaving and you're getting ready? Then once you are ready, what's going through your head at that point? I mean, you get the same bing bongs that everybody gets. Gary comes over, <laughs> says those, those words like, and then you really sort of think, Oh, this is, this is happening. The butterflies really, really start to kick off at that stage. You head up onto the road. And like you say, you, you'll hear the, the first guy, like the, mo the RPM rise, and then they fire off into the distance. For me at this stage now, being in the seated riders and all the rest, you're sort of that two, three minutes away. And you, you feel the intensity, but, but you also have a, like an ability to like understand what's going on. Like You know, right, the race is on. Ba basically, the way I look at it is, you know, the, the hair has left, 
and it's yeah, neither yeah. like the, the the greyhounds are at the gate so whoever whether it's one or whether it's 15 or 20 guys in front of you those guys are being let out and you're in your cage ready waiting to, to track waiting to chase that round the track and um so i mean you feel that that intensity like there's no nowhere like the Isle of Man that you feel intensity like the start of the build up of of a TT race I, I've never, I'm not a soldier, but I could only imagine that it's something similar. Maybe I romanticize about it, like going off to war, because no one wants to be there trying to G up because they know you know your job to do, but they all want to have a pat in the bum or just to say a good luck and all this, and just in case something bad or untoward happened. Yeah. But everybody hopes that you're going to come home a hero, and that may not happen. And so you have that, like, strange stares, quick me to the eyes with different people and all the rest i like to just have like a few people around me quiet word joke talk last minute strategies then the helmet goes on don't really talk to anybody after that and uh you start rolling up and you can feel it just building 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 yeah. and then you get to that no man's land and uh then you have this tranquil peaceful area and you're still you know maybe 30 40 seconds before you go and uh, you maybe take a look round, you see the ones that you care most about and all the rest, and then focus in on the job. Rolling up to the guy, I have to say, it's not the same. I, I've never felt the tap in the shoulder ever once. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I roll up, I have the same sort of procedure. I try to go through these sorts of motions that it's well practiced. And at this stage, I'm really well practiced at it. And you bring the RPMs up, you find the biting point of the clutch, so you, the bike sort of lurches forward, that sort of two, three inches, you'll feel the guy squeeze you on the shoulder, but I'm that focused on the main timekeeper with the flag. Yeah. If he happened to sneeze, that guy's getting dragged down Glen Crutchy <laughs> Road with me, because like, he might try to hold <clears throat> you back, but I'm like, I'm that focused on the flag, I have to say, I, it's not to diminish that guy's job, but I have never felt the tap on the shoulder, because you're that fo ultra focused on the flag, that whatever he was doing, it wouldn't really matter because if that flag moved a millimeter, the clutch is going in a way and the, and the chase has started. So here's a question that I don't think I've really ever asked anyone. When you, you've got one guy that goes up the road and obviously there's a 10 second gap. Sometimes if there's a guy missing, there'll be a 20 second gap. In that 10 seconds, the moment he lifts that flag in that 10 second start, are you counting that in your head? Have you got like a, a, a roll up procedure? Because some people roll up really slow in the hope to get there in the last couple of seconds, some kind of roll straight up and sit there with a the clutch in, with the revs rising. Like, what is it so for you? It's the longest 20 seconds in the world. Yeah. So, like, last year I was away at number 18, and poor old Gaz Johnson was missing at 17. So I had this every... And I think Sweeney was meant to be 17 in the Super Sport, and he was missing. So every race I started, I pretty much had this endless gap, and it feels forever yeah. when, it, when someone's not there. And... To be fair to the guy, the tap on the shoulder guy, he gives you a T signal to tell you that you're down to 10 seconds. And only then do I really like switch into the mode. I, I arrive, I would say, early, promptly, because yeah. you get up to your, you want to hit your marks, you want to make sure that everything's right. If you have a, a start procedure on the bike or a launch control or anything along those sorts of lines that it wants to be, that you, ha you haven't got a, you haven't put yourself under any additional pressure because you're not being rushed over the whole situation. Mm -hmm. You see him 10, even that 10 still seems forever because the road's empty. The silence has sort of dropped and all the rest. So it feels very different when there's no one there in comparison to when there is somebody there. Yeah. I mean, even psychologically, depending on where you get off the line, when it's sort of even Stevens, when you turn out a quarter bridge, you'll just see the glimpse of somebody tipping into Braddon. And uh, if you see them for more than a glimpse, you think, the chase is really on here. Yeah. I, I've already made time and I'm only going to keep making time. And if you get down there and somebody's been away 10 seconds and they're not there, you, your heart's a wee bit broken at that stage. Yeah. And, but at the same time, you might it might use that as fuel to sort of G yourself up to be like, right, you've already made some sort of error. Or you've lost time. You need to get in your flow and get going here. Yeah, I suppose with that 20 second gap, you, where, where are you 20 seconds after the... Are you going up Agos Leap already or...? I After would. I would say they're probably. They're out of sight, aren't they? Yeah, they're oh, well, by, sight, by the yeah. Garth heading <clears throat> heading down towards the hump before Quarter Bridge. Yeah, you know, mm. uh, it, it's a long old gap, especially if you know, like, you tend 
the closer you get to the front, the more you focus in and around who's going to be around you, what their pace was in practice and all that. If you know that they were very similarly placed to you, you're thinking 20 seconds could be a long time. If you know that someone's maybe had a bad practice week or anything like that, you'll be like, well, I hope to see them by Kirk Michael or something in 20 seconds. You might have taken 20 seconds. The 10 second gap's a much easier chase. But if you know like somebody's 20 seconds in front of you and they're on similar pace, you probably, you might see them going up the mountain mile and be that'll be the first time, even if you're on a good pace yourself, yeah. unless you've made an exceptional start and they've made a, a mistake somewhere, a run on or really cost themselves big. Would you rather not see anybody at all all race or do you enjoy catching them because it gives you that extra motivation just to move up a little bit and increase your pace? I think there's, a, uh, there's always a certain aspect of, I think, my own ability, I work best on the chase. Like, mm -hmm. you have that fuel and that fire. And it, it's not it's not real racing as in wheel to wheel because if you've made the time, you've already... You, you sort of feel like they should give it up whenever you arrive. They never do. Yeah. But at the same time, <laughs> it's it's one of those sorts of things where if you can see a guy and then you see another guy because the guy that you've caught first is already catching the guy in front, yep. there's just always that, that hair to chase, like I say. And when, it, when it's an open, empty road, it can be a wee bit demoralizing. I, I have had the privilege of going off at number one at the Manx Grand Prix, and it was it was quite a different sort of atmosphere in terms of being that you know McGuinness and all that talk about the bird scare. So yeah. that, that's a, that's quite a difficult lonely race, and but there's joy in that loneliness because no, if if you haven't seen anybody and nobody's caught you, then you know you're on good pace. But it, it's a very different approach. You're a CD rider, and if they said to you all of a sudden you're going off number one, how would that make you feel? Well, you've pretty much answered it. I know obviously the TT is a little bit different pace wise, but it's still you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I was number one in my newcomers race, so it was like pressure unbelievable. <laughs> like everything was ramped up to like way over to exaggerate everything because it was the first time you ever rolled up to a start, the first tap on the shoulder ever in your career, and you were the number one guy going away. So that was definitely a very different mentality in comparison to if I was given an opportunity to start number one now, knowing what you know and how to not like get ahead of yourself come out of the box all G'd up full of adrenaline and fighting the bike for the first three miles, whereas you're trying to like instantly relax yourself and find your pace, find your rhythm and get, and then like the time will come and your pace will be there and then you have confidence and well, I'm doing all I can do. And if somebody catches me, somebody catches me, but there's not a lot else you can do about that. But if you find your rhythm very early and you're still having a nice lonely race, if you're away at number one, I'm sure there's very few things that are as rewarding knowing that that road's open for you. There's going to be no distractions, no holdups. You said to you, you said earlier that um, you like a few people around you at the start before you set off and so on and a few nice words and obviously your loved one. But, um, you know, when you're riding for a team, which you do, do you feel added pressure from them or do you try and shut that out? Um, I don't think so. I mean, every rider, I think, as you well know, is there. Like, No one is going to give you a, a G up or you feel like you have to impress per se that they're going to be like, wow, we really... If you're already not... If you don't have that motivation inside yourself and you're needing somebody else to put pressure on you from a team structure or anything like that, there. you're probably not going to be cut out for, for the whole game. Um, I mean... The few opportunities that I've had for the teams that I've ridden, there's definitely been, I wouldn't say an expectation, but in terms of like, this is definitely a good opportunity here and you would be foolish to waste it. So there, there comes an added amount, but that comes more from yourself than, I, I, than anything. I, I've never had any ill effects from, from the people around me in terms of like, well, he's here or the sponsor's flown in and so I, I'm going to have to try and like, find another two tenths on the run out to Balakrian or <laughs> yeah. this, that, and the other. It, it has never, that has never been a motivator for me, but I could understand, like, the further you climb those numbers, the bigger the money that's involved, the more people that there is, there is an expectation, and there is that pressure that comes with it, and with an expectation of, well, we've given you these bikes, and you've got the best of this and the best of that and all the rest. So I, c I could understand why it would play into the mind some ways. Did it play into yours, Steve? No, you know, mine was a short uh, time, obviously, at the, at the TT. I only did three TTs, but, you know, I think, realistically, I was more result-orientated than, than, than financial. But, um, and 
as you just said, you put yourself under a massive amount of pressure anyway. You know, I've won, won the other road races, and that was, this was the king of the castle. And, and in all fairness, I didn't go there to win. I went, well, I did, of course, but I mean, I went there to try and get on the podium if possible yeah. after my first year. But now it's difficult, and because it, you know, we'll talk about more your lifestyle and what you do away from racing later. But you know, you're obviously you've got some big jobs, and you're a very clever fella um, in the industry. But um, does that kind of clash with working with a team? Do you want it your way rather than theirs? I, I mean, I, I would say, I would hope. I mean, the teams might tell you differently, obviously. <laughs> um, <laughs> that I, I, I try to come with, because my, my job is motorcycles outside of racing, I, I try to keep a professional approach, you know, because solving problems, overcoming, making sure that pro progress is done in projects and all the rest, that's my bread and butter that, that's what pays my bills at the end of the day so trying to keep that sort of mindset and mantra and all the rest and you know racing is like like just the pressure turned up to an un, unassailable amount because you don't have a year it's not a three-year project we're working on it has to happen inside these two weeks mm -hmm. and if it's not going to happen why is it not going to happen and there's there's additional stress and strain that has to be put on people, whether it's the rider, whether it's mechanics, because things are happening, failures occur, mechanical breakdowns, whether it's the performance level of the bike and all the rest. And you hope to have as much as you can, all those sorts of things prepared for and like minimize that any errors and all the rest that they don't come out. But the Isle of Man is a very special place in terms of that. Like I've seen people fall out who are like, who are like the best of friends, you know, and it's even in daft things like, uh, like 2019 jumps out at me. Uh, we had a very bad week of weather and there was a number of like scrabbles in the, in the paddock. Thankfully, I try to keep out of the paddock. I try, if it's, if it's going to be rained off or there's some delays and all that, everybody needs that sort of like space from each other. Mm -hmm. But y you know, you're on top of each other for two weeks. So y you think of like people, like people's, start nerves start to fray because it's just this this pressure cooker for two weeks and everybody wants the best to happen and everybody's best intentions yeah i think from my side i, I try to hopefully arrive with a relatively relaxed professional aid but you know when things aren't going wrong or aren't going right should i say then you you have to really like you have to press in and a lot of the time that comes more from self-reflection because like at the end of the day the person who can make the biggest difference is usually the rider. Mm -hmm. You, your wife races as well. Yep. You know, and she's not a bad hand. Yep. Um, you just spoke then about obviously keeping cool and keeping calm. And she's, I've read in an interview, she says you're very methodical, think things through for her racing and yours as well. Tandra Gee, when she passed you off a start line, <laughs> how methodical were you in catching <laughs> and trying to keep up or get past her? <laughs> You've really done your research. Um, it has to be said, it was uh, there was a, a number of sad circumstances around that. In so much as a friend had asked me to ride a one two five, and anybody who's ever met me would know that maybe I would not naturally look as a one two five rider. And um, so, first time ever racing a two stroke. I think to be honest, just jumping in there, the first look, you'd think you worked on a door in Belfast somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, I guess. Uh, There's a compliment in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And um, so, yeah, getting a small bike, particularly like Grand Prix 125, off the line, th there's a knack to it. And maybe her six or seven years experience at that stage might have come into it. But I, I have to say, going up the hill thinking I've really blown this, we, we got to a set of bands and I, I did hesitate for, I, I don't think I would have <laughs> on if it had been anybody else, but I waited patiently to pass in a in a in a timely safe space as opposed to I think if it had been somebody else they might have got lifted a wee bit harder a wee bit earlier so if I, that was the last lap I don't believe you you would not have left it no no definitely <laughs> not definitely not but it, the same applies for her I mean we joke because um she raced against her father on 125s and um like pushed him hard at the last corner of Kells, which is a real square T-junction-y type corner. So uh, she has every bit of, you know, the, the knife between the teeth as, as any other competitor <laughs> out there. So, and, and that's the game. At the end of the day, everybody's friends off track, as you well know. But when the visor comes down, 
whether it's marriage or friendship in the bar, uh, uh, it, it doesn't really count for a whole lot on track. So turn that around from what you said on the start line, where you, uh, you know, on, on Glen Crutcher, where, where, where you like a few people around you, and of course the wife. How does it feel for you when she's setting off? It's, it's, it's so tough. It is really like, until you've done it, and I, I had helped guys out and all the rest, but when you have a real, like, it's not that you don't you w wish any ill on anybody or anything mm -hmm. like that, but when you have a connection like your wife or somebody that's a brother or something or a son in many father cases or anything like that there, there is so, you feel that heavy atmosphere going up there. You feel the weight of those decisions that you've made in the pre-start area. You feel the weight of like making sure that the brake calipers are torqued and the back wheels in and the tire pressures are done and all the rest. Everything that goes on it. And seeing them off, you know, there's, so much joy comes from it because they're doing what they love. Mm. But that time spent on that pit wall, I mean, that that's a long, long time to be waiting and thinking. And especially if you have an insider knowledge, they should be here, there by now. They should be there by now yeah. and all the rest. And you're very remote, you know, the guys in the pit lane, they're not allowed uh, any electronic devices. So there's people yelling information across. It's quite a busy time anyway, but like when you're in that pit box waiting and you have to wait out every lap just in case they come in with a technical issue, you know, so you can't be diving back across to find out what speed they did at Solby. Have they been through Ramsey? Have they got to the mountain box? Where are they? And all the rest? It's a case of you're, you're in there and you're sort of isolated. You get maybe these odd signals from somebody across the wall to say she's been through or you might hear on the radio a mention something like that there but it is the longest time with like the heaviest thoughts because you're only you're alone in there with your thoughts i suppose it's one of those things where you 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 know the enjoyment that they're getting out of it so you can never say please don't do it oh, definitely not but, i w wouldn't even consider it across my mind in terms of like what what she wants to do and all the rest like and the same goes the opposite way and uh yeah the, the the thought of like helping somebody through and like sort of, I wouldn't say taking the reins, but she, we talk about like dad and lad racing. Mm -hmm. She was also heavily involved. Like her father was a, a racer and she, she's a gen two racer as I call her because I, I have to do it all my own way because I like to pat myself on the back. And uh, she, she had like, up, well not opportunity, but like at least somebody with uh, a knowledge to come through on it from a racing point of view. And uh, taking that over from, from Steve's side, uh, the responsibility as he sort of went into retirement yeah. of looking after the safety and, and how heavy that sits on you and all the rest. But at the same time, we both, we, we met through racing. So to, to, for anybody to come and sort of say, well, do you think you should maybe think about stepping back from it and this, that and the other, it, it never even would cross either of our minds. We both enjoy motorcycles in racing and motorcycles outside of racing trials. And we were at, Tong for the British Enduro there to watch Dean go round and all those sorts of things like our 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 whole house is is a motorcycling sort of family and fraternity in that way. So apart from the fact you've just said it was much easier for her, um, in the <laughs> it's always easy in the, in the racing. <laughs> so pre-season or during the season when it's down to budget time and spending, who gets priority? On me. <laughs> <laughs> no matter. Now, is I'm, that agreed? Um, she might see that differently, but uh, she would also tell you the number of holidays that haven't occurred because of my budget. So uh, I, 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 she can't disagree with the facts of that. And, and there is no grumbling from her because she also understands that, that that's a critical topic. And the same goes with, with her own money and, and spending on bikes and all the rest. It's a case of certainly we try to make the money go as far as we can for getting away for a holiday or doing the things that we want to do together and all the rest. But at the same time, there, there's all, every discussion of, well, should we get away for a quick weekend to, to wherever? And uh, yeah, but that's, oh, but the flights in the hotel, that's an hour set of tires at the time. <laughs> yeah. oh, goes over, well. <laughs> so uh, that, that math yeah, is yeah. like, there isn't a time of the year that that math isn't done in terms of like calculating out what we're going to get out of that in comparison to what it, how it will in fact uh, affect our seasons one way or the other. But you've hey, you've got a lifetime afterwards to go on your holidays. Your exactly. Holiday when you're sixty and you've you've kind of done what you yeah, you're we'll, not going to be young this young forever, are you? So yeah. we'll holiday and go to races when we're older. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, without the pressure of actually racing. Yeah.
All right, we're going to leave the conversation just there for the time being. We will pick up in part two next week where you can join me and Steve and the rest of this podcast. In fact, yeah, have a little taster now. For two weeks of the year, I get to live a professional life I've, and I get to go to the equivalent of Augusta or St. Yeah. Andrews and I get to play against Roy McIlroy or Tiger Woods or whoever your heroes are because Hickman, Dunlop, Harrison, McGuinness, whoever mm -hmm. is there, they're, they're with the best equipment and whether you have that or don't have that is, is irrelevant. So join us next week right here on TT Plus where me and Steve will be uh, finishing this conversation off. See you later, Steve. Later, mate.